uh, I did revise this. So when like the nucleus has like the odd number of uh, protons and neutrons, uh, it can like exhibit this thing called spin and it creates like a magnetic field in doing so, which is right there. So I don't know, uh, I don't know what else to say. Okay, very good. Yeah, very good. And I guess the most important thing, Saga, is this is kind of like a ball in space, right? It, it's orienting and it's rotating in various directions. But the second you expose it to an external magnetic field, it will immediately orient itself to follow those magnetic field lines. So that nucleus will immediately orient its magnetic spin to align with the external magnetic field lines. We call this the low energy spin state. And so when we provide energy in an NMR spectroscopy, what type of energy do we provide to the nucleus valve? Radio. Radio waves. Yeah, very good. You provide radio waves. And what you'll do is you'll excite the nucleus, the entire nucleus, protons and neutrons, into a high energy spin state, which is aligned against the external magnetic field. Very good. Now, what do we call the phenomena where the nucleus is transitioning from a high energy state to a low energy state back and forth continuously? Resonance. What is that called? Kushal? Very good. Good job. So that's why we call it nuclear magnetic resonance. We're looking at the property of nuclear spin in an external magnetic field, and we are observing the resonance pattern because every time that nucleus de-excites, it releases a frequency of radio wave that we measure as a signal on our NMR graph. Makes sense to all of us, right? That's why it's called nuclear magnetic resonance. Thorin, you can't forget the magnetic or you forgot half the technology, okay? All right, so Kushal, take me through the components of an NMR spectrometer here. I'm not really sure how to go about it. So. Right, so we have a sample. This is a test tube that actually contains your sample that you're investigating, right? And that sample is usually placed in a solvent that has a even number of protons and neutrons because you don't want the actual solvent itself to start exhibiting resonance or spin. So often the solvent used here is deuterium. What is deuterium, God Gibson? Is it the is it what the sample is dissolved in? Like uh. it is, but deuterium you need to tell me is heavy water. It's a, it's water, but oh, okay. it's it's literally dihydrogen monoxide or H2O, but instead of just having one proton attached, it has a proton and a neutron. So that's why it's heavier. Oh, okay. So it's basically an isotope of hydrogen. Okay. And since it has a proton and neutron, it has an even number of nucleons, it doesn't exhibit spin. Okay. But that's your sample. And the sample is placed within external magnetic field. And you can see that right there. So immediately all the atoms in that sample are going to orient themselves along the magnetic magnetic field lines, right? And what we're going to be doing is we have a radio frequency transmitter, which is going to be inputting radio waves. And what is that going to do to the nucleons in the sample? Uh, isn't that going to make it go to a higher energy state? Yeah, which is aligned against the magnetic field lines. You always need to mention that, right? Oh, and yeah. So yeah. they will flip against the external magnetic field to a high energy state. And when they return back down, they're going to emit those radio waves. And those radio waves get picked up by a detector, and that's read with an output NMR graph, right? And so that's how we create an NMR graph. Now, the next question is shielding. What is shielding? Let me ask uh, Sheldon. What does it mean when we say that an atom is shielded? Um, does it mean the electrons aren't affected by highly electronegative um, like elements around it, so the electrons are still around it. You're completely right when you said electrons around it. When we say an atom is shielded, its nucleus is surrounded by more electrons. But beyond that, you confused it. Shielding is not that the electrons are not affected. It's that the electrons have a magnetic field that aligns against the external magnetic field. And so what happens to the magnetic field that this nucleus experiences, Tharun? Will it be more or less now? Uh, less. Yeah, very good. So, so now, since these electrons are exhibiting their own magnetic field that's aligning against the external magnetic field, we need to then find the net magnetic field experienced by this nucleus, which is going to be this magnetic field strength minus this magnetic field strength of the electron. So shielding weakens 
the magnetic field strength that the nucleus experiences, right? So you simply say increased electrons equals increased shielding. And that means the nucleus is going to experience a decreased magnetic effective field strength. We measure that in gauze, right? And that's why we have B as our unit. And what does that mean for the energy required to flip this nucleus to a high energy state and back down? Would it increase the energy required? Think about it, Saga, right? The magnetic field strength is not that strong. So it doesn't oh. take much energy to flip it to a high energy state and back okay, down. Okay, yeah. So it decreases the sense? energy required. So it requires less energy. Yeah, because the magnetic field strength is weaker. So there's a, there's a less force in pushing it to a high energy state, and there's less energy released when it comes back to its ground state. So less energy required. And what does that do to the frequency of radio wave that gets emitted, everyone? There's less because you don't need that many radio waves to exhibit to a higher energy state. You need a lower energy radio wave. It's not about the number of radio wave. It's that we now need a lower frequency of radio wave, which corresponds to a lower energy of radio wave required to excite it and de-excite it. So I guess now my question is, what is this phenomenon that's known as chemical shift? Because that's the entire x-axis of NMR, right? So who wants to remind Muhammad or teach Muhammad what chemical shift is? Um. So the more like uh, downfield it is on the... NMR spectrum is like to the left. Um, the the less shielded it is, so its its environment yeah. is surrounded more by electronegative atoms. Or oh, not more electronegative. Think about it. TMS or tetramethyl silane is the most shielded compound that we know of. Right, its hydrogens are in the most shielded environment that we know. Of, right, and that's our zero reference point in our NMR graphs. So whenever you're close to that zero reference point, a.k.a. you are upfield, okay, you are very, which means the frequency of radio waves is very low. Because what's the formula for chemical shift, Thurm? Um, The signal frequency minus the TMS frequency. All yeah, over minus the TMS frequency. All over the spectrometer frequency. Yeah. And remember, with our NMR graphs, there's a high number here. So zero is on the right-hand side, and the high values on the x-axis are actually close to what we would expect the origin to be. That's why it's a bit confusing there. So here would be at like a five or a six in its ppm, right? So think about it. If we had a de-shielded environment, we'd need more energy to flip because the magnetic field strength will be stronger. So if we have decreased shielding by converse, Decreased shielding equals a greater magnetic field strength, right? And so a greater magnetic field strength would result in more energy of a radio wave required and a greater frequency radio wave. So this will go up in value, right? And remember, TMS has a fixed frequency and the spectrometer frequency is also fixed. So this is going to result in a larger chemical shift value or the signal will now be moved downstream. To give you all the sum summation or conclusion here, basically shielded hydrogen environments like close to TMS or upfield, de-shielded environments lie downfield. Does that make sense to all of us? Downfield is to the left, upfield is to the right. Very good. Okay, so chemical shift is the x-axis and we use that because we have different NMR signals based on the spectrometer that we use. So now you can see that chemical shift accounts for the spectrometer used, and it also gives us a reference value of zero, which is our TMS reference point. And as a result, we can standardize the graph for any compound. So TMS and chemical shift are solely used to standardize the NMR signals for a compound. Good. Anyone who has questions can look at the past recording, but those of you who attended last lesson, and are now in this lesson, do we have any questions about the graphs and chemical shift? I'm happy to explain in a bit more detail for you. Would we ever have to draw um, an NMR spectrograph? Yeah, definitely. Definitely could be asked to. You could be given a compound and asked to predict what the NMR spectra approximately would appear to be. So on yeah. the y-axis, would right. we have to put so signal? Oh, sorry. Would we have to put signal intensity on the y-axis? That's it. 
Yeah, you must. You must. So, um, yeah, I was good. doing a paper the other day, and it said, like, describe, like, three main features that a spectrum can confirm, like, it's a substance. Well, what do we have to talk about? Okay, question is, what are the three main features of a spectrum? Is that right? Yeah, like, to define. Yeah, to define no. substance. Yeah, so the three main features of the spectrum would be the height of each signal. Each signal that will tell you the number of hydrogens or carbons in that chemical environment. For carbon, it's less important because we can't really correlate it, so we'll just write hydrogen. Okay, and I'll teach you about carbon in a modest lesson too. But the number of hydrogens in a chemical environment, the number of signals literally would be the answer to that question the number of signals will tell you the number of hydrogen environments we'll talk about hydrogen environments again because that's usually the toughest part for students and three can anyone tell me what three would be I'll give you a hint maybe the position of the signals yeah good location of signals and what does that tell you nielsen it tells you how shielded it is. Like, yeah, okay. shielding of each hydrogen environment. Very good. Does that make sense, uh, Sheldon? Those would be the three yeah, you mentioned. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, very important. That's literally how you approach any NMR graph. So let's go through one ourselves. There's a lot of H NMR here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to throw us into the exam questions. How about that? The chem model notes, notes, notes. All right. Now, now we're going to go to the high yield nitty gritty things. You will only understand NMR spectrum once you do practice questions. So I remember there's been students who've had four lessons of NMR, but just in terms of content, and they still have no clue what NMR spectroscopy is. So only when you do questions, do you begin to really understand NMR spectrum in a lot of detail. Now, what I want you all to do while I'm opening up these notes and waiting for it to load is go into the website and open up the module eight additional questions uh, trial booklet the mod 8 uh, trial questions for me because we're literally just going to go through the NMR questions in those trial papers and I'm going to show you how we're going to answer it and then you'll get confident by the end of this lesson about both carbon and hydrogen NMR. I think this is very important because even if you have trials sitting at home you can't google search the answer to an NMR graph because it's just specific to that one graph right so you won't be able to help yourself if you don't know NMR spectra even if you're at home okay let's go through some spectroscopy graphs here and just some general spectroscopy it doesn't even have to be nmr as well just so you all get very confident with this right so here's a mass spectra question we'll quickly touch upon this one as well so you, i know you're very confident with this so you've been given butane here you've been told you know, given its entire mass spectrum and you've been able to identify and reasons of the chemical formulas with the three peaks x y and z so straight away uh, let me ask muhammad what do we call the largest molecular weight peak for a compound in here oh the parent chain yeah so this is called the parent molecular ion right so you need to identify that so you need to know the name this represents the actual molecule but with one electron knocked off hence why we call it an ion does that make sense Mohammed? yes that makes sense thank you okay good and so why what does y represent zane the peak that occurs at a hundred percent relative intensity what did we call that You're the base peak sir very good base peak nailed it good and so x just represents some other small peak so let's find out what it could be right so i would start by finding out the number. So Z is about 59 uh, atomic mass units in size. What about Y? What's the size of Y and what's the size of X? So it's 19, 18, 17, 16, 15 is X and 42 is Y. Now, before you all continue, I told you to remember 15 and 29. Those are two fragments where if you just quickly remember what they produce, it'll help you a ton in your exams. So we have a fragment that's 15 atomic mass units in size. And we know this is a compound only containing carbon and hydrogen. So Kushal, how many carbons could make up a fraction that's overall 15 atomic mass units in size? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, sir. 
How, what's the atomic weight of a carbon to push off? Um, 12. 12, 12.01, right? You've seen a purity table before, right, Kushal? So 12.01 is the atomic mass units of carbon. Right. So we can only fit one carbon in 15. Do you agree? Because if you have two carbons, it's 24. So we have one carbon, and how many hydrogens would have to be added to add to make 12 increase to 15, Kushal? Three. Three. So it's one carbon and three hydrogen. So what fragment is this? This is simply carbon, hydrogen, 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 and whatever's left, you just fill in an electron. And that's the fragment here. So whenever you see 15, that is a methyl fragment. Do you all realize that? 29. Let's apply the same principle here. I'm not going to say anything further. Uh, Nielsen, explain what fragment 29 would always be. Um, okay, so you could have two carbons. So C, wanted to see, and the rest would be hydrogens. How many hydrogens? Uh, five. Good. So 29 represents an ethyl fragment. Do you remember that? So make sure you remember those two fragments. So straight away, if Tharun remembered that 15 was methyl, he doesn't even have to think too hard. He can simply say X represents a methyl fragment, and he can draw it in his answer, right? Now, what does 42 represent, everyone? Any ideas what 42 would represent? Just butane? Wouldn't it? Sorry, butane what's, ion. Molecular, what's the molecular weight of butane, Sarah? Butane ion, isn't it? Okay, let, uh, let me check. Wouldn't it just be the um, propane? Uh, give me a second real quick. Come on quickly, tell me. What's you said 52. 52. Uh, it's, it's not 52. Yeah, I think it's 59. 58.8. Okay, 58.8. That makes sense, because what did I tell you? The parent molecular ion represents the molecular weight of the actual molecule. So Wait, so I wasn't wrong? You said 52, so you were wrong at 52. Oh, no, I mean about butane. Yeah, no, that does represent butane. So that you'd simply say is a parent molecular ion, and you would simply draw butane but with a free electron. Right, so something like this. You just do C, 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 C. Fill it in with hydrogens, and then you just add a little plus there to show that's lost an electron. Okay. Now, what would what would Y be very quickly? Okay, that's all right. So let me get a thou. What would Y represent? Uh, propane. Okay. First of all, how many carbons can fit into forty-two? That's my question for you. Three carbon. Good. And how many hydrogens are left now? So three carbons takes you to 36. So how do you get to 42? Uh, seven carbon. Seven carbon. 36 to 42. How many hydrogens do you need? I think you meant um, six. Six hydrogen. Yeah, very good. So it's a C3H6 fragment. So you'd simply do it like this. And you'd go one, two, three, four, five. And it would be six. You just draw it like this. And that's a fragment. Wait, see, wouldn't it be 43? 41, 42, 43. Yes, that makes sense. 43. So it'd be seven hydrogens there. Very good. And so you'd have another hydrogen here. So this would be a proper fragment. Does that make sense to all of us? Yeah. And if you're stuck, what you can also do to make your life easier, if it's a huge molecular weight compound, what I sometimes do is if I think, okay, if this is 43, what's the inverse of that? We simply get... The entire molecule is about 58. If you subtract 43 from it, we have 15. And so that tells me that a methyl fragment would have broken off the main molecule, which would straight away take me to propyl as well. But depending on how fast you want to get to your answer, there's, there's two approaches to find out what any peak is. Does that make sense? If it's a huge peak, just subtract it from the parent molecular ion and find out what fragment broke off it. Saga, your turn, since you said you wanted to do infrared spec B. I know you can draw 2-methyl, 2-propanol, but I want you to answer 37B for me. So what atoms are responsible for the low transmittance at 2,974, which is this descent there, and 3,366? Michelle, you're going to explain the 3,366, and Saga, you're going to explain the 2,974. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'll help you out. I'll... Would it be... Uh... Uh, OH for the 2974. I'm just going to zoom in here for you, and I'm just going to go HD. Wait, is it chemistry blue? Chemistry development. 
so you can all see the data sheet really well. Okay, awesome. So you're going to go straight to here, right? This is all you need to be looking at, right? So 2,974. It's not uh, OH. It's not OH because OH is a very broad. So it has to be CH because that's narrow. And Good, that's okay. Good. So it can't be the OH because it's very, uh, very broad. This is a very sharp decrease in transmittance. Uh, can it be the C triple bonded to an N? No. Can it be C the OH? No. It can't be any other function group. So yeah, you're right. This would be a CH. Yeah. Very good. And Krishnal, your turn. What would the 3366 potentially represent? Uh, could it potentially represent the uh, NH? Yeah, good. 3366 could represent the amine group. Anything else? Um, so what's your final okay. answer, Krishal? Is this an um, amine group here? Yeah, I believe it's an amine group. Okay, okay, okay. Now, let me just delete this screenshot and go back to Krishal. What molecule is this representing, this spectrograph? Um, 2-methyl-2-propanol. Two 2-methyl-2-propanol. Two Does that have an amine group inside of it, Krishal? Uh, no, it doesn't. So can it be an amine? Oh, it could be an OH. Exactly. Yeah. This is the OH, because that's the only other functional group here. So it's a yeah. CH bond here, and it's an OH here. Does that make sense? Yeah. So everyone, this range represents the lowest point of transmittance. Does that make sense to everyone? Right? So that's what they're showing you here. You go to the exact lowest point of transmittance, and this is the range of what that lowest point could be. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So if it's two overlapping groups, then you just logically think about it, and they've given you the compound, so it definitely can't be an amine group, right? Good. All right. Let's do a tough question. Let's do NMR. Mass spectra, carbon-13 NMR. Oh, this is very interesting. Oh, yeah, it's two possible columns. Uh, what page is this so I can go to it? I love this. This is a very good question. Uh, 13, Saga. Here you go. I'm going to give you all two minutes to have a look at these graphs. You need to tell me what compound this is. It's a really good question. Wow. All right. So the other important point here, I'm going to remove this. Actually, I'll keep this there. Actually, yeah. Then we will say... The compound did not have a color change with potassium permanganate. Did not have color change with permanganate. With permanganate. Okay. So, everyone, you'll have two minutes to do this question here. So, you open up the question. It's page 14 of your, your trial booklet. This is a very, very common exam question. In fact, I can almost guarantee you probably have one HSC question on this or one trial question on this, where you're given multiple graphs and you need to combine all the information to determine the exact structural formula of the compound. So I'm going to throw in the deep end. You have two minutes to start this, and then I'm going to start picking on you. So if you have any questions, jot them down too, and I'll answer it for you now. This is a really high yield question. All you have to do, everyone, is copy everything I've taught you so far. When you look at mass spectra, what are the two peaks you look at? Use those two. In infrared spectra, which side of the graph do you look at? Look at only that side. Look at your data sheet. And since you've been given carbon-13 NMR, even easier, you literally just look back at your data sheet. And this is going to teach you a bit about carbon-13 NMR too. You literally look at the data sheet and it'll help you out. That's why carbon-13 NMR is so easy. So I have a question. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It doesn't apply directly to this question, but it's just about how do you differentiate or classify between a broad and a very broad wavelength? Oh, wavelength. Very good question. It says very broad and broad. That's subjective, Zane. Very subjective. Yeah, that's what I mean. Cause... Yeah. yeah. See, the only reason you would know, so Zane, just think of it as broad. So broad is in, it looks kind of like a whale's fin, right? That's how you think about it. Okay, now you won't need to know what makes something very broad or broad. There's no cutoff for that. But then do you notice how for alcohols, it's only between 3,230 and 3,550. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. It's 2,500 to 3,000. So if you see a broad band between 2,500 and 3,000, it has to be an acid. If you see a broad band at 3,230 to 3,550, it has to be the alcohol. That's the only way you can distinguish it, right? Just the location. You won't be able to know what very broad and broad really is as a difference. It both will look like this, okay? 
And so, so this is like, I don't know, I'm trying to get the answer out of you for this question, but would you classify the one, the peak here at um, 29885, a very broad peak? It's just, it's not very broad, is it? No, um, it's not that okay. broad. So you wouldn't broad consider it? Would look, broad would look more like, see the thing though, Zane, yeah, right. is you have to be cautious because the other part of the molecule can change the shape of this a little bit. So what I would do, Zane, is I would say it could be accounted for as a broad peak. I'd say probably not. But since it's at 2985, you could even say potentially, it's definitely not the OH of the acid, because I'd have to be very broad, right? But um, I'd probably say that would probably be the CH, if anything. But uh, if you'd like saying to be very safe, you can even say it could be the OH of the acid, but then you have to correlate with the rest of this, the other two graphs, and they'll help you with confirming what it could be. Okay? Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks, sir. All right. One more minute. This one's easy. I want to give you a hydrogen enema. That's when they become a bit more challenging. Okay, let's go through it. Let's get started. So everyone, let me ask Ryan Khan first. Mr. Khan, when you look at this infrared graph, which side of the graph should you be completely blind to? Uh, 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 after 1500, sorry. Yeah, after 1500, it's pretty useless, right? Let me just have the infrared section of that graph available to you. Yeah, so less than 1500 is pretty useless to me because it just says CO bond, maybe with an ester. Um, it could be a carbon-carbon bond, right? So we don't really know. They've, they've given you numbers to kind of help you out here. So we might need to acknowledge it in this scenario. But what I see here is I see 29850, and this is not very broad. This could potentially be regarded as a broad band, but I'd say even that is a, is a tough call. I'd say this is probably a, this is a narrow band. I know it's narrow because it's got one sharp like or two, three sharp peaks. A broadband would clearly look like that, it'd be curved. Okay. So we said this would likely be the CH bond. And does everyone understand that? It can't be the OH of an alcohol and it can't yeah. be the OH of an acid because that has to be very broad. And the OH of the alcohol lies outside. It starts at 3230 and this is 2985, right? So that's just a CH bond, but What's the other peak that's very important for me, Saga? What's this 1,715 represent? I told you uh, that 1,715 represents the uh, um, CO bond. Carbonyl group. Okay. Yep. So whenever you see 1,750 or a peak around there, a trough around there, all of you, without even looking at the data sheet, should now start saying to me, this is a carbonyl bond that's present in the molecule. I also see 1,370. I know I told you not to look at it, but they've literally given you the number. So that means you might have to. So let's have a look there. 1,370. It can't be a CO. It can't be a CC. What could it potentially be, everyone? Nothing really. Do you all see that? Can't even be a C carbon carbon double bond. And it can't, it can't be a carbon oxygen bond. There is no interval that has 1,370 um, for it. So I'd say that's not important at all. What about 1,175? What could that be? Carbon. No, because that's 1,100. Remember, the trough has to be... Carbon double bond to O. Right, right. Not double bonded to an O. Single bonded to an O. Do you all see that? Is everyone with me? The 1,175 yes. could be... Oh, I thought you said 1,715. No, sorry, 1175. That could be a potentially a carbon bonded to an oxygen. We're just going to put a question mark there and circle it. Okay, that's what I would do right now. So I know this compound is either an aldehyde. What could it be, everyone? It could be an aldehyde. Be or a ketone. ketone. What yeah. else could it be? That's all I thought. Ester? Yeah. yeah, it could be an ester. And it can't be a carboxylic acid because it doesn't have the OH of the acid. So straight away, know it's one of those three functional groups. Very good. Now, let's go back to the carbon-13 NMR spectrum. The same principles apply, everyone. Do you see how they didn't even have a y-axis? Because that's literally just signal intensity, and we don't care about the units. The interesting thing is, for carbon NMR, it's the same exact principles, but now you need to reorient yourself to focus around the carbons. The same principles apply. Sheldon, what were the three things any NMR graph can tell you? What does the height of the peak tell you? Wait, me, sir? Yes. There's only oh, the one number of um, hydrogens. But in this case, since we're looking at carbon oh, the carbons, yeah. number of carbons in each environment. But this is the one thing I want you to remember. This is the one 
weakness of carbon-13 NMR. The height doesn't really correlate to anything. Okay, so I'm going to cross that up. This is a case where height doesn't really matter. Do you all see the differing heights? It actually usually is not in the relationship with the number of carbons in each environment. So we don't really have to consider that. So it makes life easier for you and me. What does the location tell me, Thorne? Uh, degree of shielding. Shielding. But now you are solely looking at the carbons. You have to forget about the hydrogens. And that's a skill. You need to be able to solely focus on the signal here. And what about the... What else do we have to look at? So we've said height. We've said location. Number of signals. Yeah, very good. What does the number of signals tell you, Saga? Um, it tells us uh, what's called the number of hydrogen environments. Oh, Saga, we're looking here at carbon. Carbon environments, sorry. It's carbon yeah, environments, that's, that's my mistake. Exact same principle as everyone. So yeah. let's have a look at this. Now, what you'll notice is with carbon-13 NMR, when the signals lie in the low range, it's very hard to distinguish them. Because look at this. A signal at... At eight, that has to be a carbon carbon. We know that, right? Because only five yeah. to 40 represents eight, could lie only in that range. But what about 29? Uh, 20 it could, oh, sorry. Take it away. Uh, it could either be the, um, the C double bond to the O or the C bond to the N. But from looking at the um, other uh, inference, spe uh, inference spectrum, we could say it would be the, the C double bond O. Could even be a carbon bound to chlorine or a carbon bound to bromine. Do you agree? And you have to be exhaustive here, Saga, because sometimes they'll throw you those curveballs, right? 10 to 70, 29 lies in that range too. Right? Oh, yeah. Yep, that's it could right. be that. It could be the carbonyl group itself. The 29 could be the C double bonded O. What else could it be? You need to be very exhaustive. It could be the C bound to an N, so an amine group. But what did we say here? Could it be an amine looking at graph one? No. Have no. an amine functional group. So good. So this is how you integrate your information. Do you see what we're doing here? We're looking at the other graphs and looking at how that's going to affect our interpretation of this one. So that's a skill. Yeah. So that definitely can't be the carbonyl, I mean, the, the amine. It has to be a carbonyl or it could be a halogen potentially, but that's less likely as, as, as we all understand that. Could it be the alcohol? No, because that's 50 to 90. So let's move on. What about the 39? What Wait, uh, you'd be getting the yeah. similar results to the 29. Wait, for 429, would we also say that it's carbon bonded to a carbon, or would we just ignore that? 29, no, it could be a carbon. No, you definitely would not ignore that. Very okay. good. This, this is part of being comprehensive. Very good. It could be a carbon bound to carbon, too. So you definitely would account for that. Very good, Nielsen. All right, and the same thing with 39. 39 could be carbon bound to carbon. It could be a just literally go down that list until you exhaust everything. The key here is you need to be very exhaustive. Could be a carbon bound to a chlorine or a carbon bound to a bromine, or it could be a carbonyl group. Just remember, it can't be the same thing, right? The carbonyl group, unless there's two different carbonyl groups, cannot make two different signals, okay? So that's the important point to make. This one, you can clearly say, say what it is. 212, what must it be, everyone? There's only one thing that it could be. Uh, the um, aldehydes or ketones? Yeah, very good. So the, the ketone or aldehyde carbonyl group. Very good. Very good. Good. So we know straight away it's not the ester or acid here. Do we all agree? Because an ester or acid must make a signal at 160 to 185. So we yes. know straight away we can take the ester out. And do you see how we're using both the graphs to now reach one conclusion? So now we know it has to be either an aldehyde or a ketone. And in our other additional thing it could have, is a chlorine or a bromine. That's the only other thing. Makes sense to all of us. Yep. Okay, let's go to the final one now. So mass spectra, what are the two peaks, Kushal, that we need to be looking at? There are only two peaks we need to be focusing on here. What are they? Oh, would it be the first two? These two? Yeah. Oh, no, no not that one. The, the 29 and the 43. Oh, no, not 29 or 43. What did I tell you, Kashal? The two peaks you look at, Thorin T. 72. 72. This is the most important peak, the parent molecular ion. Because what does it tell us, everyone? Uh, where, where it originated from? Like, what's the original um, compound? You get the molecule. You literally get the molecule. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so important. Compound X, you literally will get the molecule that compound X is made out of. Now, let's assume... This is where we have to kind of use a bit of thought experiments. We all agreed it's either a ketone 
or it's an aldehyde. Do you all agree? Yeah. Right? And it could or it could not have, so it could be plus or minus a halogen added to that. That's what we know. Wait, um, Prithvi, mm. couldn't we uh, uh, straight away eliminate the, uh, the aldehyde? Why do you say that? Um, uh, if you scroll down to the question, doesn't it say that there's no color change if you add potassium permanganate? Yeah, uh, yeah, very good, very good. So I, I wanted to wait a little bit before going through that because that uh, was another separate one, but very good, you're very, yeah. very correct. But let's imagine we haven't seen that yet, right? So I got to focus on this yeah. here. So it could be a heater and an aldehyde, and it plus minus could or could not have a halogen attached. So with 72, I want you to think about what the formula of a ketone or an aldehyde is. What's the general formula of a ketone? Think about a ketone, it simply has exhausted two of its bonds to form the carbonyl group. So it's the same as an alkane, which is 2N plus 2. Sorry, please, could you all just mute yourself just to reduce the background noise? Thank you. All right. So the way I break down what the general formula could be is that it could have this structure here, right? And then we exhaust two bonds in making the ketone functional group. So it's going to be Cn, H2n, and we subtract two from hydrogens because we need two bonds to make the carbonyl group, and we just add an O. Do you all agree? So if it was a ketone, that's what the general formula would be. What about if it was an aldehyde? So let's think about an aldehyde, right? The carbonyl is at the end. Does that really the change? Hydrogen the hydrogen will be all alone. Yeah, you're completely right. The hydrogen will be all alone. But the question here is, Darren, is it going to affect the chemical formula? Yes or no? Sorry, could you repeat that? I kind of lagged out for a second. Is it going to affect the chemical formula, whether the carbonyl is at the end or at the middle? If we have butanol versus butanone, is it going to affect the, the formula? No. No, right? This is where you use your thought experiment. The only thing that a carbonyl will do is take two bonds and uh, off hydrogen. So whether it's a ketone or an aldehyde, it would have this formula. So now my question is CNH2NO, let's assume there is no halogen attached. Let's just see what happens. Has to equal to 72. What must N equal to? Start guessing. So start with N equals 3. What would the compound's uh, molecular weight be? This would be propanone or propanol. What should it be? And then? it would be four, wouldn't it? Like it should be four. But, okay. Yeah. So if you sub n equals four, what do we get? Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. One up. One approach I had when I was doing the mass spec was I looked at the forty three, and you know how for the previous question we we realized that the forty three was the um. Prop. Prop. Uh, oh, yeah. You would get the purple fragment. Yeah. Can we just go from there? Yeah, you definitely can. See, that's another benefit or a shortcut that Tharun's made in his head, which is now he remembers 43 could be a propyl. The only thing, Tharun, is when it starts getting more complex, it could be the oxygens that could be contributing to the 43 as well. But uh, yeah, that's definitely a good hypothesis to make. So um, what could we say? Tharun, when you start, oh, yeah, so what, what do you get? You get our 72.06400. Good. So we can quite certainly say now that you see those two peaks there everyone the 39 and 29 that probably just represents two carbon carbon bonds right of the boot the um butanone or butanel and it's probably not a chlorine or a bromine since the molecular weight fits so well when we assume that there's no halogen present so i would say here that we either have butanone or Butanol. And if it's a butanone, we want to know um, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so there's literally no other isomers of butanone because butanone, the carbonyl is either here or it's here. It can't be anywhere else. And that's still butanone, right? That's still butan. Yep. So we just call it butanone. So the quick question here is is it butanone or butanol? All agree? Now we've yep. also been told that there's no oxidation. Uh, it did not have a color change with permanganate. We know that an aldehyde can further oxidize into a carboxylic acid and cause a color change. Yeah. But we know the ketone cannot. So Australia, what's our answer, everyone? Uh, butanone. Very good. So do you see how we integrated all our different findings together with one another? 
that's yeah. how that's the skill you all need to be building when you're looking at these graphs. You need to keep looking at this graph, come back to this one and say, how is it going to change our interpretation of this? Come back to this. And do you see how I didn't even look at other fragments? So it all depends. For example, Thurin remembered 43 is proper, which I don't remember. He for sure could have thought, okay, it has to be more than three carbons in size straight away. And I think that is a very good skill to have. To, to look at numbers and just generally say, okay, that has to be at least three carbons in size. This has to be about four carbons in size, something like that, right? Yeah. All right. So we've answered that question. So let's do a hard one. Usually get the hard ones through looking at a PM neat. Are you good ones? What's this mass spectrum? We've done that. What's that? Fragments, no, I can do that. That spectrum, infrared, can do that. Oh, all right, oh my. Oh my, and splitting. Okay, how about I quickly explain to you all what splitting is? Okay, so before we go through this, I'll quickly teach you all what splitting is so you can all start going through more exam questions as well. So coming back to the notes, Come up to hydrogen and MR. Okay. I'll pull this out. Okay. Now, with NMR spectroscopy, this is solely for hydrogen, everyone. We don't have it for carbon. For carbon, it's just carbon 13 NMR. But for hydrogen NMR, we can have low resolution hydrogen NMR or we can have high resolution hydrogen NMR. The only difference is with high resolution hydrogen NMR, we see a phenomena called splitting, which gives us one extra piece of information. OK, now let's have a look at this. This image here, we see chloroethane. Everyone with me, forget about the splitting for now. I want you to think of it as one signal. Imagine you're looking at low resolution NMR. Okay, so this is one signal, that's another signal, and that's your TMS zero reference point. Okay, now let's look at the hydrogen environments. There's a highly polar chlorine. Okay, remember what I told you, right? The hydrogens attached to a carbon are usually in the same hydrogen environment. So all the three hydrogens attached to this carbon, you'll agree are in one hydrogen environment. We'll call that hydrogen environment one. Everyone with me? What about these hydrogens yeah. here? They're in another hydrogen environment because they're attached to another carbon and they are closer to chlorine. So let me ask Sheldon, right? Sheldon, these hydrogens here, compared to the blue hydrogens, are they more shielded or are they de-shielded? De-shielded? Yeah, I, I like to think of the polar molecules like a black hole, right? They're going to be attracting or sucking all those electrons off those hydrogens. But those hydrogens will be stripped naked or de-shielded, right? So we have two hydrogen environments, so we should have two signals. Two hydrogen environments equals two signals. Now, the red hydrogen environment or the red signal, I'll use a red color to represent this, the red signal should it be downfield or upfield, Sheldon, since we just said it was deep oh, more down. downfield? Very good. Easy. Good job, right? So looking at the two signals that we see here, which one is more downfield, Sheldon? The red or the blue that you see here? The red. Very good. And the final thing I told you is the height tells you the number of hydrogens in each environment. Do you see how there's no arbitrary units on the y-axis? So all you have to do is ratio it. So we see there's one, two, three, four, about four and a half. I'd say maybe four and a half units for the height of the red signal. And the blue signal is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight units. Eight units. So you just do four and a half ratio with eight, and you want to get single whole numbers, right? So what can we do? You can times it by two, you'll get nine on 16. And then what could we do? We can divide it by, can we divide it further? No. That's weird. Why is it? No, so it's not eight units exactly. It's 7.5. Yeah, it's about 7.5. So let's do it like that. So if we times it by two, we'll get nine divided on 15. And that's about two on three. So that makes sense. So do you see how the ratio tells you and approximately, not the number of hydrogens, even the ratio of hydrogens in each environment? It could be this compound 
has nine hydrogens attached to, you know, one atom, not carbon, but, and this could have 15 hydrogens. So the point I'm trying to make here is you, all you get from the height of the peaks is the relative number of hydrogens in each environment. Okay, good. All right, now let's talk about splitting. Now, splitting follows this principle called the N plus one rule. What this means is, right, Let's look at a signal. So this is a red hydrogen environment. This is the blue hydrogen environment. OK, let's have a look at that red hydrogen environment. Now, what I want you all to do is I'm going to rub all this out. Look at the red hydrogen environment. How many hydrogens are attached to the adjacent hydrogen environment? How many hydrogens do we see? Everyone? Three. Three. And if there was, Darren, let's say that this was another carbon and this had H, 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 how many hydrogens are attached to the uh, adjacent to this hydrogen environment? What would you say then? Six. Six. Does that make sense to everyone? So what we're doing here is we're counting all the adjacent hydrogens in the immediate left hydrogen environment, in the immediate right hydrogen environment, and we're adding it up together. Okay? Only the immediate adjacent. If there was another carbon here, we wouldn't count those hydrogens. So only the hydrogens that are in the environment to the right and the hydrogens that are in the environment to the left. Here we just have chlorine, so all we need to focus on is these hydrogens. What we're going to do then is you're going to add plus one, right? And that's the number of splits you should observe to see for this hydrogen environment. So let's have a look and see if we met that. So we have three other hydrogens in the adjacent hydrogen environment. We're going to add one, so that means there needs to be four splits, or what we call a quartet signal for that red hydrogen environment. And what do we see? We see the quartet signal and it follows this pattern. It looks like Pascal's triangle. It has this little triangle shape. It always has that, that intensity pattern that you see there. You don't need to memorize all of that, but uh, you, this, this is what we call a quartet. Right? And let's try using the opposite. Let's try doing the inverse here. So whenever you see a quartet, imagine you've never seen the molecule before. Whenever you see a quartet, all you should say is subtract one. And now you know how many hydrogens are in the adjacent environments to this hydrogen environment. So since there are four signals, I subtract one. And that means for that hydrogen environment, whatever, how many hydrogens there were here, in the left and to the right, in total, we should have three hydrogens. Does everyone agree? So now we just apply it in the reverse manner. Now I'm showing you from the signal how to get information about the molecule. And what we did up here was we used the molecule to get information about the signal. Does that make sense? Wait, so yeah, you said um, it kept, it says the total for the both adjacents. So we yep. just so if we saw that, we would have to assume that the total for both adjacents would be four, but we wouldn't know how. No, not four. I mean, three, three. three. Sorry, yeah, three. What did I tell you to do? When you see four signals, what must you do first? Minus one. Good. So how many adjacent hydrogens are there? Not four. What yeah. Did you say? Three. Good. Keep going. So um, you assume that the adjacents would be three, but then also as you continue on, you figure out if it's going to be all three because there'll only be one other adjacent. Yeah. So if you see three, for example, Greg Gibson, what I'm thinking is either the compound is just an ethane molecule, for example, and it could just have three hydrogens like that. Mm -hmm. It could be in the middle of a chain, and it could be that there are two hydrogens attached here, and it could be that there's one here and the rest are like a chlorine or a bromine, for example. In both scenarios, do you see in total there are how many adjacent hydrogens? Three. This is what you should be coming to. So this is how you convert the signal into the molecule. Does that make uh, sense? You have to yeah. use thought scenarios in your head. But yeah, that's how you do it. Don't worry. When we do more practice questions on HNMR, high resolution, it'll make more sense. How about we try this one? So Zane, let's say you see this signal here. You see a triplet. This is what we call a triplet signal, right? So you see there are three, there's three splits. So Zane, how do we get information from the signal? How do we go to the molecule? What must we do? Subtract? I'm not sure, so sorry. So remember, you subtract one, okay? 
and that tells you the number of hydrogens in the adjacent environment. So when you subtract one zane, what's three minus one? Two. Good. So you know straight away that this, oh. uh, whatever hydrogen environment that we have, so let's say this is just the hydrogen environment we're studying, that's the blue signal. On each side, or maybe only on one side, there's only two hydrogens. So it could be like this. And it could be that this is the hydrogen environment at the end of the molecule, and we only have two hydrogens in the adjacent environment. And that could be another carbon, for example. Does that make sense, Zane? Yes, so we're sir. brainstorming now, right? And Zane, what if I told you to go from here? So let's have a look at this compound here. If I'm talking about this hydrogen environment, Zane, yeah. how many splits should it have? So, how Sorry, you you? so this hydrogen signal, how many splits should it have? How many times should the signal split? So C, plus, C plus yeah, one, so three, plus one, so the four. So before you plus one, Zane, you must add all the adjacent hydrogens, right? So for this hydrogen environment, how many hydrogens are adjacent to it? Uh, two. Two. You do two and you do plus one. So what does that give you? Three. Three. So you would expect this hydrogen environment to have a triplet signal. Triplet. What do you notice? Do you see the triplet signal there? Yeah. Does that make sense, Zane? So don't worry, it would make even more sense when we go through it in detail. Now, then all of you should be having one question right now. I've shown you how to interpret it, but what question should the curious student have at this point? Think, 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 think. What about the CL? Yeah, you could you could definitely see the CL. We're not studying CL environments. We're solely studying hydrogen environments. So the CL does not impact anything at all. The CL will only impact the shielding or deshielding, and that's accounted for by the location, right? So we've explained the CL. Any other questions? Think curiously. Is it how? I don't know why do we use it? <laughs> yeah, my question would be, well, why are we adding one and subtracting one? What does that even mean? Why are we doing it? What's the principle behind it? Right? That's what you should all be asking. Okay. Now, it's due to a phenomenon. I'm just going to write it here. It's called spin spin coupling. I don't even think you'll ever have to explain this even in a trial exam, but this is just so you understand why we're adding one, subtracting one. The phenomenon is called spin spin coupling. And I'll explain it in very simple terms you understand it, right? Now, I want you to imagine that we have a carbon atom here. Actually, how about we just imagine we're looking at hydrogen NMR. So looking at a hydrogen atom here. This is a hydrogen atom. Everyone with me, right? And this is going to be hydrogen environment one. So we'll call this hydrogen environment one. Okay. Now, what can happen is when we add an adjacent hydrogen, when we add an adjacent hydrogen, OK. What property, what nuclear property does the hydrogen in the adjacent environment have? Anyone know? What's the property which NMR spectroscopy relies upon? Odd uh, nucleus and protons. Good, which is spin. It's not a property. Spin. Odd nucleus spin, not property. sorry. Nuclear spin is a property you should all be shouting back, right? Now, do you agree this hydrogen environment is sitting, this hydrogen environment one is sitting in an external magnetic field. Everyone with me, right? Sitting posh comfortably in an external magnetic field. When you add another hydrogen, what will that other hydrogen do? It will initially align with the external magnetic field, but what happens when I supply it with, with energy, everyone? What's it going to do? Go to a higher energy state. Good. Now, Look. just think about this. Just think about this, right? It's now flipped to a high energy state. And what that means is magnetic field lines now lie against the external magnetic field. Now, do we all agree this hydrogen here is producing its own magnetic field? It's now yeah. against the external magnetic field lines. Now, I want you to imagine this is you right now. You're experiencing one unit down in external magnetic field. But now right next to you, there is a hydrogen that's flipped up and it's exerting 0 0.5 units magnetic field strength up. What is the net magnetic field you're experiencing now? 0 0.5? Yeah, yes. in what direction? Down or oh, aligning with the magnetic yeah, field. Very 
Very good. So in this scenario right here, you're experiencing 0 0.5 units of magnetic field uh, down. But let's say this hydrogen next to you, it then de-excites back to ground state, right? So it's a nuclear spin, then de-excites and it returns back down. And now it's exerting an external magnetic field of 0 0.5 units. So now in this scenario, what magnetic field strength are you experiencing now? Add the two fields together. What do you get? 1.5 units. 1.5 units of magnetic field strength downwards. So do you all agree this will result in two slightly different radio wave frequencies? Because at these two different points, the slightly different magnetic field strength experienced by this hydrogen, they'll so experience two slightly different radio wave frequencies that will be required to excite it and spin it up. Do you all agree? Right? So in scenario two, I'll require a greater radio wave frequency because there's a greater magnetic field strength. In this scenario, I need a slightly lower frequency. Is everyone with me so far? Okay. And so what that will do is the actual main signal, if you zoom into that main signal with high resolution, you'll actually see two little, two little sub-signals. And the sub-signals, so if this was chemical shift in PPM, this is close to TMS, right? And that's like low frequency here, and that's high frequency. The peak slightly to the left represents the frequency that was absorbed when the adjacent hydrogen was facing downwards, right? Because your hydrogen was experiencing a stronger magnetic field. And the peak slightly to the right, which is close to the lower frequency end, represents the scenario where this atom here was experiencing a weaker magnetic field strength. So when there's one adjacent hydrogen, how many peaks did we just produce up here, everyone? What do we see? How many peaks? Two peaks. Two. And so when we have two hydrogens surrounding it, we get three peaks. With three hydrogens surrounding it, we get four peaks. And that's the pattern, so forth, so on. So if you look at the follows Pascal's triangle almost. So if we think about this, right? The way you understand it is if you're looking at your hydrogen environment, right? If you're looking at the adjacent hydrogens, if there's only one hydrogen, there's only one adjacent hydrogen. It could be spin up or it could be spin down. AKA, how many possibilities are there? Two. Does everyone agree? Now, what if you yes. have two hydrogens? If you have yes, two three. adjacent hydrogens, yeah, right? If you have two adjacent hydrogens, they can both be spin up, they can both be spin down, or they can both be up and down. So how many different possibilities is that? Three. Do you all see that? Or if you have N hydrogens, you will have N plus one possibilities of shielding and deshielding. And that's why we have to add one. And what this phenomenon is called is spin-spin coupling. So you'll never need to explain that. As long as you got the overall gist, the reason we get this splitting of signals is the adjacent hydrogens are shielding and deshielding this hydrogen environment. And the number of adjacent hydrogens will affect the number of peaks that will observe. Good. So have a read of the notes too, but does that generally make sense? Yeah. Yeah. It's very low yield. So beyond this, you will not need to understand it any further. But I guess this table is probably the best explanation for you, right? This is your hydrogen environment. And if you have one adjacent hydrogen, there are two possibilities of shielding, deshielding. Two adjacent hydrogens, there are three possibilities of shielding, deshielding. With N hydrogens, there's N plus one possibilities of shielding and deshielding. And that'll split the signal N plus one times. And that's why we apply the N plus one rule. Very good. And it's just the names you'll hear. This is very important because you need to say these words when you are speaking about it in long response questions. So you don't want to say, we get three peaks, we get four peaks, we get five peaks. We need to say it makes a triplet signal or a quartet signal for four or a quintet signal for five or a sextet signal for six. Now, I can almost guarantee you five, six, and seven, you'll never have to touch. You'll probably in your exams be dealing with everything up to a quartet. Okay, but if you see a quintet or a sextet or a septet, you know what to call it. Okay. Here's a question for all of you. 
this represents the hydrogen enema of a carboxylic acid. Identify the structural formula of the carboxylic acid. Throwing in the deep end now. And justify the splitting pattern observed. Don't worry about all of this stuff. This will just be confusing. They're just drawing a ball and stick model of random stuff. Okay. But focus solely on uh, the graph that you see here. I'm going to give you all about a minute. This is a very good question. Maybe two, maybe two minutes. Okay. So think through your head, and this is where you'll start to find out questions you might have. And if you have any questions, just jot it down. In about a minute, I'll get you to ask it to me. Okay, let's go through this. So, what's our game plan? So, let me ask uh, Nielsen. How are you approaching this? Just told you it's a carboxylic acid. Okay, interesting. And you see three signals. So how many different hydrogen environments do we have? Uh, three. Yeah, right. And you know, this is hydrogen high resolution animal. So I'm not going to focus on the splitting just yet, because it's going to complicate things. Always start with the number of hydrogen environments. But if you have three hydrogen environments, let's just break this down. Let's imagine we had a uh, methanoic acid, right? If you had methanoic acid, Nielsen, how many... Oh, let just rub that out to here, here, and an OH, right? How many hydrogen environments do we have here, Nielsen? Do you have two? Yeah, very good, right? So you see that there's two hydrogens bound to that carbon. And I told you, usually when you're bound to the same carbon, you're in the same hydrogen environment, which is the case here. So these are in one hydrogen environment. But then you see there is another hydrogen bound to OH. So that's going to be a second hydrogen environment. So we see three hydrogen environments, so it can't be methanoic acid. How about we try ethanoic acid? So ethanoic acid here. Wait, so how are there three hydrogen environments for that last molecule? There weren't, there weren't three, there were two. Oh, okay. What did I explain, right? What did I say? Here, here, that's one hydrogen environment, that's another. Yeah, so there's two. That's why it can't be methanoic acid. Does that make sense, Scott Gibson? Yeah. Okay. Both these hydrogens are attached to this carbon, so they're in one environment, and that hydrogen's bound to an ethanoic acid. Right, so ethanoic acid's going to have a carbonyl group, it's going to have an OH, it's one, two, three, four, it's going to have one, two, and three. So what could that be? How many hydrogen environments do we have here? Two? Yeah, very good. We have two, right? So you see one hydrogen here. You see one, two, three hydrogens here, right? But I told you that these hydrogens are attached to the same carbon. So that's one hydrogen environment. And that hydrogen there is the second hydrogen environment. Let's try propanoic acid now. This is how you should be breaking it down. Propanoic acid. How many hydrogen environments do we have here? Darren? Three. Yeah, you see one hydrogen bound to the oxygen, so that's one hydrogen environment. I told you these two hydrogens are bound to the same carbon, so they're going to be attached to another. This is another hydrogen environment, so we'll call this hydrogen environment two. And we have a third hydrogen environment that I'll do in green, which represents all of these hydrogens. So these are hydrogen environment three. So this very well could be propanoic acid. So let's test that theory, right? Now, what you want to do is you want to go from propanoic acid and try linking it to this, this splitting, right? So let's talk about the shielding and de-shielding of all these hydrogen environments. Now, everyone, what you do for shielding and de-shielding is you want to circle the most polar compounds. So what are the most polar atoms in this entire molecule? The O and the H. Uh -huh. Yeah, very good. In fact, OH is even more polar, and the O is pretty polar, right? So the closer you are to that OH, the more shielded you are, 
I mean, sorry, the more deshielded you are, because all your electrons would be ripped off, and the more downstream your signal would be. So let's look at purple. Let's look at the orange hydrogen environment, and let's look at the green hydrogen environment. And do you want to tell me whether it's upstream or downstream? Okay. So how about we get uh, Zane? You're going to give this one a go. So the hydrogen in the purple hydrogen environment, Zane, it's right next to the oxygen, which we said was highly electronegative. Right, or highly polar. So what is it going to do to that hydrogen? Or it's it's deshielded. Yeah, it's going to be highly deshielded. It's going to rip all those electrons off the hydrogen. It's going to be very deshielded. So it's going to be downfield, right? And it's going to be the most downfield. Are you with me, Zane? Yeah. Very good. And now, Muhammad, are you back? Okay, that's all right. Let's ask. Uh, yeah, Ryan. I'm back. Sir. Oh, good, good. All right, so Mohammed, you see there are hydrogen environment too, right, Mohammed? We're close to the to the carbonyl and to the oxygen, but we're not as close as the purple hydrogen environment, right? Yeah. So we'd still have some deshielding, but will it be as much as the purple hydrogen environment? No, it won't. No. So all we're going to say here is it's going to be downfield, but not the most downfield. Yep. Right. And what about the third hydrogen environment? I'll get, uh, Kashar, you're going to answer this one. The third hydrogen environment, the green one, is the furthest from the oxygen, which is going to rip its electrons off. So when you're the furthest away, are you deshielded or are you relatively shielded? Uh, relatively shielded. Yeah, very good. You can still have your electrons because you're quite far away. That You won't be able to strip the electrons off you, right? So it's going to be relatively shielded. Or what would we say, upfield or downfield? Um, it would be, is it downfield? Downfield is when you're further from TMS. Remember, oh, okay. the closer you are to zero, the closer you are to TMS, which is shielded. So when you're shielded, what are you, upfield or downfield? No, you're upfield. Yeah, upfield, right? Remember this, Kushal, never forget this. Downfield has a D for deshielded, right? So deshielded, D for downfield. Make uh, sense? Okay, so shield is this is upfield. And let's see if that correlates. Is everyone with me? So let's have a look at the signals now. Let's see. So that means that the three the three hydrogens here would be the most upfield signal, which would be this one, right? The second signal, the orange one, should be this one. And the most downfield signal, the OH, should be here, number one. Right? That's what we've said. Do you all agree? Let's see if the height matches now. Does the height match to some degree? What do we all see? Now, it looks a bit weird. We see hydrogen environment one and two, they should have the same number of hydrogens, right? But that, we know that's not the case because we hypothesize there's an OH group and there's the two hydrogens, the orange hydrogen environment. But with HNMR, sometimes it's not too, too accurate. So don't focus too much on the height here. So it still could be the case. But you clearly see that the three hydrogens are higher than the two hydrogen environment. Do you all see them? And that makes sense. Because like I told you, the, the taller the height of the peak, the more hydrogens in that environment. Okay? So good. That makes sense so far. Now let's talk about the splitting. So this is where you look at the molecule, you predict the splits, and you want to check if it makes sense with the graph. So let's look at the purple hydrogen environment first. Zane? How many adjacent hydrogens do we have here? Zero neighbors. So it's just one peak. Very good. And do you see the just one peak there? There's no splitting at all. So very good. So Zane, what can you say? It makes sense so far, right? Yeah. So put a tick. You want to put a tick to say, yep, yeah, we can explain that peak. That must be the OH signal. Let's have a look at the second one. Uh, the second one, don't even look at the number of peaks yet. So you see four, but let's see if we can deduce that ourselves, right? Look at the orange hydrogen environment. Kushal, how many adjacent hydrogens do we have? Hard two. One, two. Oh, I, thought, I thought you said the orange one, so I was looking at the second one. No, that's the, what do you mean? This is the second one. I meant adjacent yeah. hydrogens. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. I thought you meant the adjacent. second one. 
you know, you never look at the hydrogens itself. You always look to the left and to the right, never look at the hydrogens itself, right? So you look at the adjacent hydrogen environment, how many hydrogens does it have? Yeah, three. Three, so you're gonna do N plus one or three plus one, and how many splits should you see? Four, and you see that there, so that makes sense. And now, Saga, you're gonna look at the green hydrogen environment. How many hydrogens do we have adjacent to the green environment? Plus three, three. Wait, did you say it? Wait. To the green environment, sorry. Oh, I just, uh, two, 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 sorry. sorry, sorry. So you're going to add one. Oh, you said, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and what do you see? Three. You see the triplet split, you see the quartet split. So you can explain the entire graph. So this must be propanoic acid. Does that make sense? Makes sense. Yeah, but, very good. Uh, yeah. So I have one question. Yeah. Um, You see how the heights for the first, oh, wait. So the height matter for height? Yeah, I think it does. For See, no, you're completely right, God Gibson. It does matter. In fact, in all your exam questions, it's not going to be the case that height doesn't matter or something like that. This mm -hmm. should have been twice the height. The only reason this wasn't twice the height was this is actually representing ethanol. If you mm -hmm. look here, the molecule that we're representing here was ethanol. I gave you it was a carboxylic acid. But either oh. way, do you see how we can explain it best? Um, as propanoic acid. And if this were an alcohol, you would say it would be ethanoic, um, ethanol. And it would make sense. So it could be most, one graph could represent multiple um, types of. Um, no, compound. no, no, it can't, it can't. Only because we, I told you to overlook the fact that these are the same height, but they shouldn't be. Remember that was the issue? Uh, it was acid. So yeah, mm -hmm. technically this can't be a carboxylic acid, but if it were to be one, it would have been propanoic acid. Uh, I'll just okay. take you through the principles there, okay? So now let's start doing exam questions and it'll make much more sense. So let's do a HNMR. Oh, I don't even know if you can barely see this, but how about we try this? Here's a uh, data for question 31. And what is it asking for question 31? What does it say? Oh. Um. What page is this in? Uh, question 47. I'm page 47. Oh, that's a very good question. Oh my God. Oh my God. 11 marks, 31. Okay, this will take us a bit longer than 15 minutes. How about you will try this question your own time and I'll take you through it um, next week. But how about I just take you through how to interpret the NMR signals, okay? So let's only answer the NMR questions for this one. So you can also do the N, um, okay, molecular weight. Oh, we can very quickly do it. How about we try it? All right. So organic compound has a form of CXHYO2Cl. Uh, a dilute solution of this compound has a pH of 4.5 at room temperature. So what does that mean straight away, Zane? What must it be? So can you repeat the question, sir? pH of 4.5 at 25 degrees. You know it's an organic compound so that has carbon and hydrogen, so what must it be? It's an acid. Very good. Good job. It says straight away it has to be a carboxylic acid, right? So it must have this functional group. Everyone with me? Right? Every line should give you a bit of information. So I've given you all the graphs, and the first question is, on the infrared spectra, label the two peaks that correspond to two functional groups other than the CCL group in the compound. The CCL peak has already been identified. So let's just identify two peaks that correspond to two functional groups, right? So let's answer that. So on the, what graph was that? NMR, I mean infrared. Looking at the infrared, oh, here we go. We see one at about 1,750 straight away. Mr. Porter, what are you yelling back at me? Uh, CO. Yeah, not CO, carbonyl. Because CO Carbonyl. could mean this, right? C double bond. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Just C double bond O sounds very messy. Just say carbonyl. Because in your exam, you're going to be saying carbonyl. If you say C double bond O, if you write that in your exam, yep. you'll be owned as my student. This is that is my fault. Street. That is my fault. And asking about broad peaks, what does this look like to you? Broad or sharp? This one here. Pretty broad. It looks pretty broad to me. Broad. Okay. Thank you, Zane. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, sorry. Oh, uh, sorry. You broke up, so I didn't even hear what name you asked. Yeah, I know. That's fine. Anyway, um, 3,000. 
you see the lowest point or trough at 3000. So what could this be everyone? It could be a CH, but remember this is very broad, so it's not the CH. It could be potentially, it could be the alcohol if we're looking, but remember I told you this interval, the 3230 to 3550 represents the lowest point that it could be. And the lowest point of this broad band is at 3000. So that tells you it's the acid broad band. Does that make sense to all of us? Mm -hmm. Yep. Right? So the acid broad band. So we straight away, we've just simply confirmed uh, our conclusion that this is a carboxylic acid. It hasn't told us much more. And here it's just told you it has a carbon chlorine bond as well. So you notice it's a carboxylic acid that's uh, been halogenated with a chlorine. That makes sense, right? But it has one chlorine. Now, what information about the structure of the compound can be deduced from the pH? Same thing as up there. It's a carboxylic acid. Nothing else you can derive from it. Okay. What information about molecular mass is provided by the mass spec? See, they're literally holding your hand. They're babying you in this trial question. If I was going to write your trial exam, I would straight away just give you these three graphs and say, identify the compound and expect the HSC to be like that. Because like I told you, HSC is easier in terms of content, harder in terms of application. Harder. So, and the HSC, anticipate you're literally just going to get these three graphs and you're going to say, identify the compound. And how about we try that? Instead of being babied by all of these questions, well, what the mass spectra tells you, why are there two parent ion peaks, why is there, what information is provided here, what information is provided here. Let's go straight to finding out what the structure of this compound could be, okay, from these graphs. So I'm going to stop babying you too, and I'm going to give you all three minutes to have a look at page 48 and 49 and draw the compound for me. 48, 49, draw the compound and... We will jump into it. So at about 3.20, we'll start going through the questions. Treat the second exam question and don't look at the rest. Just solely draw the structure of the compound. You know, it's a carboxylic acid and it has one chlorine atom bound to a carbon. That's all you need to know. All right, what do we have? So let's go through it. Let me ask... Haven't I asked much of this, this lesson? Dewey, Mr. Dewey, you're going to be answering this one for us. So Dewey, we've already gone through the IR spectra and we basically said that this contains a carboxylic acid functional group and it contains a carbon bound to chlorine. That's all we know, right? That's pretty much everything that we have. So now Dewey, what about here? What does this graph tell you? What what do you look at in this graph, Dewey? You look at the parent molecular ion mass ion mass Which one is that? Ratio. You see, you see a hundred and oh, it's very hard to read. Ten or one hundred and eleven. Yeah, you see hundred and ten, hundred, yeah, hundred and eleven. I believe so. I can't see it too well. They con converted it, but if you look at the actual page, it's a little bit accurate. Can everyone? Can everyone see it better on the website? What what numbers are these? Nah, it's the same quality. 20, yeah. 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10. So it's 110, 109, 108. Yeah, so you can logically work that out. 109 and 110. Now, can anyone tell me why we're getting three peaks that are very close to one another? Because usually, if you've all seen enough mass spectra, you usually only see one parent molecular ion peak. Did you all realize that? It's usually one, and then it's very far away from all the other fragments. So why are we getting three slightly different molecular weights? Can anyone tell me? It's because a different number of electrons was knocked off. Mm, no, not quite. Because remember, I told you, for HSC, you assumed that always only one electron was knocked off. And remember, Isotope? even if three electrons were knocked off, it's not going to change Nielsen. It's not going to change the atomic mass by one unit. Okay. So like 18... 18,000 electrons Nielsen needs to be knocked off to equate to one atomic mass unit. Oh, right, right. right? That's not possible. So, anyone? Could it be isotope? Very good. So Dewey would have got full marks for one of those questions, which was account for the slight differences in the parent molecular ion. And it's because some of these compounds would be an isotope of the actual molecule, but containing deuterium, which contains one proton and one neutron instead, 
instead of uh, pure hydrogen, right? And some could have carbon-13 attached to them. So make sure you remember this mass spectra, one of its huge benefits is we can actually determine isotopes and their relative abundance. Do you remember when we did 35.45 for chlorine? That's because I think 65% of chlorine is chlorine uh, 35, and I think like 35% of chlorine is chlorine 37. Now, the way we got these percentage abundances in nature was we simply got a bunch of chlorine samples all over the world, and we smashed it up through mass spec, and we determined the average relative abundance, right? So the mass spectra was integral to development of the periodic table. The way we get 35.45 is using mass spectroscopic analysis of chlorine. So it determines isotopes too. So remember that. Maybe just write that in your book. It determines isotopes. Very good. So you can use any of these, but just think about this, right? You've got a compound that's 108, 109, 110. You know it has one chlorine. Can anyone guess approximately how many carbons it should contain? Three. Three. Yeah, if you think about this, it's got carbon, it's got hydrogens, it's got uh, two oxygens, because remember the carbonyl group and also the OH group of the acid, and it's got a chlorine. So all I do is I get, I get 110, I'd subtract a chlorine, I'd subtract two oxygens, and then whatever number I have left, that's just something I need to balance with carbon and hydrogens, right? So what's 110 minus 35.45 minus 2 times 16? What do we get there? So subtract a chlorine and two oxygens from 110. What do we get, everyone? Yeah? Tell me, Ryan. Um, 6.5, so. so. 110 minus chlorine and two oxygens is 6.5. Oh, I'm sorry, I minus the carbons as well, sorry. Um, no, no, no. 42.55. 43.55, is that right? 42. Yeah, 42.55. Good. And so I know, okay, so the carbons and hydrogens need to add to 42.55, which means I can only have three carbons, which would take me to 36. And how many hydrogens would take me to about 42.55? Well, if we think about it, let's just draw it out. Uh, we've got this, we've got carbon, we've got carbon, and we've got a chlorine. So we need one, two, three, four, four other carbons. And that will take us to about 40, right? So we can assume that this compound is of this general structure or some kind of variant of it, okay? Good. All right, so we can say, all right, so we've got the general structure of this compound. We just need to determine, is it going to be a, a linear chain? Can it be branched, everyone? If it's three carbons, is it possible for this compound to be branched at all? No, because even if you rotate this bond up there, it's still going to be connected here. It's going to be the longest chain, right? So do you all see how we can't have a branched compound? It has to be the linear chain. Yeah. The, the 108 would have been the actual, uh, the, this relative abundance here, the highest relative abundance parent molecular line would be the actual relative abundance of the normal isotope. The 109 and 110 represent radioactive isotopes. Yeah, good. So that means this is the general formula of the compound. We can straight away assume that. And let's see if it, it fits out with the rest of the, the graph. So let's go back here. And I guess now, everyone, what are the different positional isomers? Because we said the chain cannot change, but what can move around? Can anyone tell me? The CL. Very chlorine. good. So now the final question is, is the chlorine attached to the second carbon? or is it attached to the third carbon? That's the final step to get to our answer. So let's have a look at the hydrogen NMR to answer that question for us. So what I would do now is I would draw the compounds, right? So I draw the two isomers that we can have, right? So since we're looking at carbon enema, let's solely just draw the carbons right now. So the carbon one is attached to the hydroxyl and the chlorine could be here. And we could have the other isomer, which has this structure here. So which one would it work out? So let's try with this one. How many carbon environments should we have? So for isomer one, this is isomer two. How many carbon environments should I have for isomer one? Three. 
three. You just think about each carbon. Each carbon is about something different, so it's in its own unique environment. So that's three. What about the second one? How many carbon environments should we have? Also true. Yeah, very good. Now, I know we said height was not important. You can see here the height is not important. We're all about the same height. So we can't really say much about the number of carbons in each environment because there's only one carbon in each environment. What about positions? Let's think about this. So we'll call this carbon environment one, two, and three. So carbon environment one, it's connected to a highly electronegative O and a carbonyl group. So it'd be de-shielded or shielded, everyone? De-shielded. Yeah, so it's going to be downfield or upfield? Downfield. Yeah, very good. I'd say most downfield. What about carbon environment two? It's close to a carbonyl. It's close to a chlorine. But it's not directly attached to either one. What would you say? It's like semi, like like a little bit de-shielded. Yeah, so you could say um, slight de-shielding. De-shielded. And therefore downfield. Right? But if you think about this, what is this carbon directly connected to? It's directly connected to two other carbons. Right? But what about this carbon, everyone? That's connected directly to a chlorine. See. So it's going to be? De-shielded. Yeah, it's going to be downfield. It's going to be a second most downfield, right? So looking at this carbon in a mass spectra, this downfield signal must represent carbon environment three. Is everyone with me? Yes. In this one, what would this represent? Environment two or environment uh, one? Uh, oh, yeah. I had to read that. Sorry. That signal here, which is very downfield, represents carbon environment one, which is that carbon environment there because we said it was the most downfield, right? What about two and three, everyone? What does that represent? Uh, three is the next one down, and then yeah, uh, two good. is the next one. Very good. Good. And so that makes sense. We're going to tick it. This definitely could be the molecule. What about this case here? Uh, you could say the same thing, except uh, the position three and two are switched. Exactly. Of, so this yeah. would be the most downfield still, right? But now two would be... The second one that's downfield. And this would be the most shielded one. Very good. So I'd say, okay, it doesn't really tell us much information on carbon enema. It just tells us there are three carbon environments and one's very de-shielded, which we know for both scenarios there. But not too much information. Let's look at the hydrogen enema and try coming to some information here. Now with hydrogen enema, see what it tells us. Chemical shift, one doublet, quartet, singlet. Okay, what this is telling us, everyone, we're just looking at it. So this is the peak at about 11.2. This is the peak at about 4.5. It's basically all the information, but in table form for you. This is the peak at 1.7. I'm telling you 1.7 has a doublet. I think it's because it's hard to see. They've given it to you. 4.5 has a quartet. And 11.2 has a singlet. Now, a little bit of a tip to all of you. If you know there is an OH group in the compound, what would the singlet represent? That OH group. Very good. Good pickup, Saro. But anyway, we'll come to the two compounds. I'm going to draw them for you again. So we could either have... And this is where you want to draw the hydrogens because we're looking at hydrogen environments. Do you all agree? So let's draw the hydrogens here. So we can have one which is this, or we can have OH, C, carbonyl, C, C, CO, H, 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 as such here. Okay, so having a look here, let's count the number of hydrogen environments here, everyone. How many hydrogen environments do we have? Let's block it off. That's one. Three. Good, three. So we have two, and we have? One, two, three. This is our third hydrogen environment. Okay. And in this case, what about the heights of them? What would, what would we expect? This would be one unit in height. This would also be one unit in height. It's and this would three, be three units. Three. Right. Yeah, very good. And what about this one here? How many hydrogen environments do we have? We still have three. three. But what should the heights be now? 
Uh, it should be one, two, and then two. Yeah, one, and I'll do it in a different color for you all. It should be two. It should be two. So what do we see just looking here? Do we see two signals that are the same height? And remember, we know the singlet has to be the OH, right? We know that because only the OH has no surrounding hydrogen environment, so it has no splitting at all. Do you all see that? So that singlet yeah. has to be the OH. So straight away, without even going any further, we see a quartet and a doublet, right? We see two different heights, first of all. Before we even talk about the splitting, we see two different heights. So what must it be? Should it be isomer 1 or should it be isomer 2? Isomer 1. Isomer 1, right? Because the other two signals are very different in height, about three times different in height, right? One, two, and three would take you around that same height. So we can say that isomer one is what this compound is. And the reason we know that is because the OH is this signal. And for isomer two, the other two hydrogen environments should be the exact same height because they both have two hydrogens. But since they're not, it should be isomer one. But how about the splitting? Let's very quickly explain the splitting. So we know why this is a singlet. There are no adjacent hydrogens, right? So now that we know it's isomer one, Let's try explaining it. So out of these two hydrogen environments, this one and this one, which one is more shielded? Three. Yeah, three is more shielded because it's further away from the chlorine compared to two. Do we all agree? And two is even closer to the OH and the carbonyl group, right? So hydrogen environment two, the green hydrogen environment, should represent this, right? And the blue hydrogen environment, or three, should represent this. And let's look at the splitting. We said this has to be a doublet. Does that make sense as to why it's a doublet? Look at the three yeah. hydrogens. How many adjacent hydrogens do we have? One. One. So what's one plus one? Two. Two. It's a doublet. What about the, the, what do we have here? A quartet. Okay. How many hydrogens in the adjacent environment to carbon, to hydrogen environment two? Three. Three hydrogens. Three. And if you add one, what do you get? Four. Four. <gasps> That's how easy it is, right? This is the hardest enema, hydrogen enema and carbon enema spectra can be. But do you all see the principles as to how I approached it? Literally yeah. location, height, and uh, you can look at uh, also the number of signals. You can look at the height of the signals. You can also look at splitting as well, which is just correlating it to the adjacent hydrogens. Yeah. Very good. Good job, guys. Do more of these questions. Literally do all of the NMR questions you can do. And next lesson, come to me with specific NMR questions. Okay? So try doing as many NMR questions from this trial booklet as you can. Okay? Good. Any questions? No. Saga, I think Saga and uh, Sheldon, you will have Matt's class yeah. now. Feel free to head on. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you for the lesson. Yeah. It's very yeah. helpful. Bye, Saga. Good. Good to hear that. All the best. Yeah.